Okay, hey everyone, it's uh, Doodle Bud here again, and obviously I have a very special guest. We got Gemma Miley, for also from Tom Studio, and today we're going to be learning kind of how to start calligraphy. So, <laughs> quickly, uh, hi Gemma, thanks for for joining us. Hi, it's so nice to be here and have a little <laughs> lesson with you this morning. Perfect. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, so um, we connected over Instagram and uh, we went back and forth a little bit. And I would just sort of been playing with learning calligraphy a little. Actually, I got some stuff at Christmas time. Didn't go so good. I was trying to learn it. I was having challenges. We connected. And then you sent me this beautiful starter kit and everything worked out of the gate just right away. And I was like, wow, like finally I was confused with inks and nibs and paper and just the whole process. I just followed the intro kit as like a starter kit and I started enjoying it right away. I thought, you know, I had so many challenges. We, we got to get someone on here who knows what they're doing when it comes to calligraphy. And if, if you can help save someone all that hassle and time and just have results right away, that'd be great. So just tell us a little about yourself. Great. Yes, yeah, so sure. So um, I've been, well, I first got my first calligraphy pen when I was probably about nine or 10 it was a real 80s kit <laughs> with a plastic <laughs> pen that my parents gave me but no. I was hooked from then on in and I used to just practice my handwriting at school and I wasn't kind of really concentrating on what I was learning I was more interested in how my letters looked cool. how my handwriting looked so um, I've always really been into uh, lettering and just handwriting and fountain pens and calligraphy and then it was kind of, I guess, about 10 years ago when it yeah. really had a, a boom in popularity. So I thought, this is great. This is something that I can already do. You've been doing at that point, while. I was probably at your, I'd had a bit of a break because, you know, it wasn't so, it wasn't so fashionable for yeah. quite a few years. So I was probably at a similar stage to you. So I just need to get myself back up to speed. So, um, yeah, did that. And then I ran a wedding stationery business for about six or seven years or so. Nice. Um, calligraphing, yeah, it was really good fun doing um, people's place names and yeah. their orders of service and things like that using calligraphy. I just really enjoyed it. So I've just kind of been doing it ever since. And then um, when Corona hit, yeah. weddings obviously dried up. Everyone's yeah. wedding, unfortunately, was canceled. So I came to work with Tom, my husband, who makes calligraphy pens and um yeah I've been working with him ever since so I haven't been teaching so much but we've been having a great time designing new pens and putting kits together and just doing all things calligraphy really yeah and uh you know just this little kit that I got got me a lot more interested in calligraphy than I was before I got some other stuff so you guys are doing something right <laughs> I'm really glad because there's so many kits out there. It's kind of hard to differentiate differentiate yourself and know what works and what doesn't and what's good for beginner level. So I'm glad that you're yeah. finding it useful. Yeah. So that's where I thought we would sort of kind of do it today is is almost have a quasi you know calligraphy class. So someone who's interested and knew as much as I did, which is nothing other than it looks really nice and this should be easy, right? Um, <laughs> so we we're going to talk a little bit about you know, how you get started, some some pros and cons, things to avoid, and just how to get started so you have success. And then we'll teach a few things and learn it. And uh, mm -hmm. we'll just kind of take it from there. Sounds good to me. Well, let's get your camera set up. Okay, so we got everything set up, our camera's ready to go. Now, one thing I noticed with the kit is you included this little packet of tea. And um, I guess that's an important thing in it, like, you know, explain your workspace, but also I guess maybe a little bit about just environment I guess this is something you just got to be a little more calm or relaxed with is that sort of what the tea is for exactly yeah well um Tom's workshop is based in Dorset um because we ship worldwide we thought it was a nice little touch to send a tea bag out from a local tea maker um and yeah it's nice to just get yourself a drink set your workspace up make sure it's quiet if there's kids that they're occupied doing something else and it's a nice time to just take a little bit of time for yourself and by its nature calligraphy is quite mindful so um mm -hmm. i've always got a cup of tea on the go when i'm doing okay. my work so environment is also important i think so yeah it's like anything you need to kind of get in the zone anything creative if you can get in that flow state then it just time passes where you don't really notice and it's it's really good for your mental health I think 
Yeah, absolutely. I can totally agree with that. So let's get started. So you have uh, a nib holder there and we got some nibs. Um, how do you like something as simple as starting off? Like let's, let's walk through it. This pen holder is uh, one that we designed and it's pretty unique in that you've got this uh, universal flange here, the brass part, which yeah. means you can switch up the nibs. You can use a tiny little, I don't know if I've got an example, but there's a tiny little um, nib called a brass ear. Um, and it's really, really small. So you just tighten the screw here and it fits a tiny nib and then you can put wider nibs in. So um, with most pens, they'll only fit certain certain types of nibs. So this is really- Yeah, I got cool. one of those here. This is one I bought. It's it's quite nice, but I noticed that I didn't know that early on. I bought a few nibs and some of those nibs didn't fit in this one. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's really nice to be able to, especially if you're out and about traveling, if you're on holiday and you want to take your pen with you, it's nice to be able to take a little selection with you and know they're all going to fit, and not okay. drip it, drop in your ink pot. So shall I show you how this works? Yeah. Would that be useful? Absolutely. So, so the way that you put your nib in, can you see my pen? Yeah. Oh, I can so see it perfectly. This, yeah. There's this little gap here, and then there's this little screw here that tightens and untightens. And what you want to do is take a nib. And then kind of loosely fit it, so loosely yep. tighten the screw, so it's kind of it's holding it, but it's not really you haven't screwed up yeah. as tight as it will go. Yeah. Take the nib, take the nib out. Yeah. Tighten it a little bit more, so that what you what you want to do is you want to be holding the nib using just kind of surface tension. Yeah. So if you just push it in a little bit, you shouldn't have yeah. to ram it in. Yeah, I'll open um, mine you should a find more. that it's, it's pretty secure. Yeah, I got so to open mine of... a little too much. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah. Have you got it? I think so. Yeah, there we go. How far so out the good does the about... go? Does that go like down the center line of the holder? Exactly, yeah. So the tip of your sure. lip here should, should roughly line up with the center of your holder. Yeah, so I you don't want to push it too far. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's pretty good for me. You don't want to cool. stick it over too far, but that looks fine. Okay. So the key, the, the one mistake that sometimes people make with this is that they'll put their, put their nib in and then just tighten it as much as they possibly can to hold it. Yeah. Um, and it, the will, it will won't probably, work. Yeah, the tines will squeeze together and then it'll mess exactly, it all up. Exactly, yeah. You don't want to bend your nib and you don't want it dropping off when you dip into your ink. That too. So, okay. so this is the best way of doing it. Awesome. <laughs> and then you'll, so yeah, your pen's all set up then. You can also on the end, so you get a little Allen key here. Oh yeah, that was a really that's a super cool feature, a really really cool feature of this pen. Yeah, so this is pretty unique and it's really nice because everyone's writing angles obviously different and everyone's handwriting is different. So on the top, there's a little screw here. I've set mine up, but I'll show you. If you yeah. put a little um, wrench in here and loosen it, you can adjust. The angle of the entire flange here. Yeah. So depending on how you hold your pen, you might want to have it at a shallower angle. You might yeah. want to have it more um, straight. I kind of have mine in between. So you and can kind you of, like flip that thing like essentially around, and then you could almost do it if you're left-handed. Exactly. Yeah. So if yeah. you're left-handed, and uh, you flip your pen over, yeah, you twist it around. Take, obviously, take your nib out and put, put it in the, the other way. So yeah, now you got a lefty and a righty uh, exactly, oblique yeah. holder, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty nice, isn't it? So you don't have to buy two. Yeah. Um, a lot of left-handed people will use a straight pen because they don't need this um, yeah. angle adjustment that us right-handers need. But some left-handed people just like to write with an oblique pen, so it's really it's a um, handy little feature to have. Could you maybe just explain that oblique really quick, why it exists versus a straight pen? Because when, you, when you're a non-calligrapher, you see this and go, why on earth does it do that? Yeah, so basically, um, it's to help you write at the correct angle. So, copper, so especially with things like Spencerian and copper plate calligraphy, more so with copper plate, you need to write at a specific angle, so it's 55 degrees. Yeah. So you're, basically, your nib needs to be pointing to the top yeah. right hand corner of your page okay. and with a straight pen you can do that but it involves having to um, yeah like over crank your wrist I, I first tried doing copper plate with a flex uh fountain pen and it was so hard to do some of the characters because you just can't get your wrist to the right angle so this is what that fixes then 
Exactly, yeah. And it helps you to maintain consistency because you sure. I guess as you found you probably you can use a fountain pen to do copy play and it's great for just doing drills and things like that. Yeah. Up. But it's really hard to keep the angle consistent and with yeah. things like um traditional copper plate, it's so precise that you need the angle to be the same all the way along. So it just helps point your hand in the right direction. But if you're left-handed, you're kind of already doing that. So a straight pen is really great. Okay, you're cool. already writing in the right direction so this kind of it's like a little adjustment for us right handers that really helps so yeah so, so we've got our nibs at the right angle it's not going to fall out because we've adjusted the flange properly and then another really useful thing that comes in the kit which i think you've probably got is On this right little now. guy here Ooh. yeah it's a magnet it's with a spring but it's absolutely brilliant it's so simple, but it's such a lifesaver. <laughs> so yeah, basically, it. it's just like an ink reservoir. So the, where the, the magnet holds the spring in the nib, you can get these um, fixed. You can buy nibs that have the spring fixed to the nib, but okay. obviously it means you can't take it off and put it on different nibs. So that's yeah. what the magnet does. Mine's just come out. Um, and the spring so kind of acts as a reservoir. Any nib you want. Exactly. The only ones it doesn't fit on are the very, very small ones. Okay. So like a 66 F, it probably it won't It's like on, a, a, a tiny feed on a fountain pen. Basically, yeah. yeah. So you could do, instead of doing a couple, maybe a word, you could do a couple of lines without having to read it. Yeah. So it's hand, things like if you're writing poems or long or prose, yeah. anything, any long or pieces of text that are useful. You're, you're just about to do your masterpiece flourish stroke and you run out and you're like no that was perfect <laughs> you oh, got a little more yes. in the chamber <laughs> oh i've been there <laughs> i've been there so many times so yeah. yeah this is a little piece of genius and i love it so i always have one of these on my um nib okay. all, all you've got to do is stick it over the vent hole on your nib yep. so the little hole in the middle yep. just make sure it's my <laughs> It likes to do that sometimes. And actually, those magnets, I've seen those before. As a little side thing, I play uh, a weird instrument called the, the Jews harp or the Jaws harp. And there's some Russian ones I have. And you put those same little magnets on the instrument that change the pitch of it. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah, so it's a weird little obscure thing. I go, oh, I have some of those already around the house on something else. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? That tiny, yeah. unassuming thing that you wouldn't think did anything. Is actually yeah. pretty versatile. Absolutely. Okay, so you're ready to go. Um, you got paper there. Yeah, so we've got, so I, if I'm just practicing, I tend to use layout paper. We call it in the UK, we call it layout paper. It's kind of like marker paper. Okay. It's very thin. Yeah. Um, but it's bleed proof. So your, whatever ink you're using, uh, just a really nice smooth surface that shouldn't bleed. You okay. shouldn't get it's gonna your inks laying out everywhere. So I just use that. And the other great thing about it is it's see it's kind of translucent. So you can put I use guidelines normally to keep my writing nice and straight, but you can see yeah. your guidelines through okay uh, so that's through it. So you don't have to use a light box or so you don't have to draw your own pencil lines, which is quite handy. Okay. So so yeah. again, what's the type of paper? What's it called again? Uh, you said let me show you the this is the brand that I use. Sure. Because uh Okay. So I don't know if you have paper. this in the States, but we have, it's Dale Rowney. Okay. But it's called layout paper that way. So, um, yeah, cause I, I, yeah, I might've seen something like that, but I thought, how can that possibly not bleed through, but I guess it's bleed proof. And then I was worried about since it's so thin, would it maybe you be constantly jabbing the, the nib through? It's yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? Because it looks really cheap and nasty, but actually it's really smooth and, um, I guess it originally must have been developed for places like design agencies and ad agencies where you're using markers and you don't want yeah. them to, you're doing um, rough so you don't want them to bleed. So okay. it, yeah, it happens to be really good. I wouldn't use it for any official pieces or if I'm doing no, but it's wedding for practicing, or something. It's great. Yeah, it's really nice. And also you don't have to worry about messing up them because it's not the most expensive thing in the world. Okay, well, I'm going to go pick some up. There's a place nearby my house I can get some, I think. Oh, I definitely recommend. I've always got a huge stash of this, and I my little girl uses it as well when she's practicing her writing. Awesome. Thank you for the tip. 
that's okay yeah so you've got your you've got some guidelines i think haven't you in the kit there yeah i got them here and so uh you know i, I can't see them as well but i have been sort of practicing but i can i can see them enough i think so on here uh i should say so i practice copper plate calligraphy and i kind of have a more modern loosey goosey kind of style of calligraphy that i use okay um and so i guess is modern calligraphy just like a relaxed copper plate then? Yeah, so I, it's got its roots in traditional copper plate calligraphy. And okay. I think it's really important to have at least a basic understanding of um, the traditional forms of lettering so that then you know how to break the rules. Like if you know what the rules are in the first place, you know how you can bend them and how you can okay. change letter shapes. So yeah, um, I guess the term modern calligraphy just refers to a much more organic kind of playful style. And um, So I guess like yeah. uh, classical versus jazz. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, you still got to know how to play your instruments extremely well, but you get to sort of go all over the place versus follow the exact notes. Exactly. And I'd also, that's such a good example, because I think sometimes it's actually harder um, to do, like to play jazz or to do modern calligraphy if you don't know what you're doing in the first place, because you need yeah. to know all the theory behind it. So not yeah. to put anyone off, but we do, when I teach, we do um, go through a little bit of history, a little yeah. bit of why we set our paper up how we do yeah. all of the practice tricks we'll do um i'm quite fastidious about so that then you can go off and make it your own really yeah, that makes sense it's how science works you got to know the fundamentals and then use those rules to make something new and cool precisely perfect so for that reason i think we have these guidelines in the kit that we sell um, and these are copper plate guidelines. So shall I explain these a little bit? Absolutely. The un uninitiated. So the, you've got um, these X's running down the side here. This is called, this area here is called your X height. And it's basically the area that you draw all the bodies of your lowercase letters in. So like the round bits of your P's and B's and D's, your S's, um, anything lowercase will fit into here. And then you've okay. got a, a line here at the top called your ascender line. Um, and that's basically to give you a guide for the upper limit of your ascenders on letters. So L's, the upstroke on your L's, yeah. H's, B's, etc. Um, the descender line here is the opposite. So that's to just give you, give you a guide um, for the lower limit of your descenders on letters. So G's, Y's, P's, those sort of letters. Um, and then your waistline is your midline. Your baseline is obviously the baseline that you're writing along to keep everything nice and straight. Okay. So I use this, you know, with copper plate, you'd use this um, very accurately, but I, with modern calligraphy, it's nice just use it as a guide to keep everything vaguely in proportion. Yeah, because you don't so want letters what... getting out of proportion, like they're now all of a sudden they're jumping way up too high or your slant is off too much. You know, you just yeah. sort of play within the, the rules, like uh, rigid flexibility. Yeah, gives you a little framework to work in. And I okay. should say also these lines here, these slant lines here are set at 55 degrees. So they help you to keep your writing at a nice angle, which is surprisingly diff difficult. I notice when I teach people from scratch, because your tendency is want to write quite upright and to, yeah. to use your normal handwriting and you almost need to switch off your handwriting brain. Yeah. And switch on your drawing shape brain. Yeah. And kind a, of it feels a bit unnatural to start with. Yeah, it it is, you know, like an art form. Like it's it's all new strokes. Like you don't do paintbrush strokes when you're, you know, doing drawings or printing. And same with calligraphy strokes. These are different than what you're used to. Yeah, exactly. And I'd say if, even if it seems difficult to start with. A lot of it is about muscle memory. So the yeah. more you practice your basic strokes, the more your hand will get used to them. And then you'll just, it's like playing a musical instrument. You'll just do it without thinking. Yeah. And almost if you overthink it, that's when you go wrong. But it's building that muscle memory with these new strokes that you're not used to doing. Yeah, absolutely. So it's probably really good for our brains and keeping yeah. them nice and young and active. Okay, so we got some guidelines set up. And we understand, okay. you know, how to stay within the the lines and stuff like that. I guess the next step is that, uh, I guess, ink and dipping it. Yeah. So um, I've got a couple of inks here. 
So this is um, black acrylic ink, which is really nice because some inks, some inks will bleed um, and this one doesn't. It's, not, it's kind of viscous enough that it won't bleed. So when you're learning, you haven't got the added stress of my inks going all over my page. Okay. Um, and it's also permanent. So once it's dried, um, you're not going to smudge it with your hand and it's, you can paint, if you, you can paint over it, you can do washes over it if you want to. So oh, it's nice. quite a nice, yeah, it's a nice, it's quite versatile, this one. So cool. that's, this is kind of my go-to. Okay. And then I also, I use steamy ink quite a lot as well. So I've just decanted a bit of steamy ink into here. Okay. I, I'm showing on my um, camera here, just some other ones I picked up from the store. And one was, one is Higgins and then another one is Cali. And, uh, I you know, cause <laughs> it was in the calligraphy section. Are those any good? Oh, you know what? Which one? Which Higgins is that? Is it a this, it's Higgins? It's just a Eternal? Higgins black calligraphy. It's a waterproof, waterproof black ink. I don't okay. Know. Um, I, so I tried I it a little bit, and it's very different from the other ink. Like it's it uh, it sort of works, but yeah, just not not as nice as the other ink that you supply. Yeah, it's amazing the consistency of if you get a, six black inks next to each other, the consistency of all of them is so different. Oh wow. Um. There is a really nice Higgins ink that um, is great for beginners, which is called Higgins Eternal. I don't know if okay. they had them in the store, but if you can get hold of that, that's a really nice one to use. And okay. it is just not permanent, so less okay. likely to ruin anything that you get it on. <laughs> yeah, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so your other so ink, when... you said you decanted that into that little uh, jar there. I just, yeah, I did it for today because it's, uh, although to be honest, so this one here comes with a little dropper. So this is quite um, handy for just for being able to control the amount of ink that you put onto your nib. Oh, that is okay. I put some of that into a little thing, and I would dip into it. But you, yeah, if you just use the dropper each time. Yeah, you can do you can do either. I'm quite often a bit lazy, and I'll just use the dropper okay. straight onto the nib. Cool. Um, so you can do that, but I've decanted a little bit here. Just so I don't have to keep screwing and unscrewing this lid. Yeah. Okay. So when you're when you're dipping your ink, um, first of all, I should say, if you've got a brand new nib, just make sure that you prep it first because all nibs come with um, like a factory coating that stops them corroding and rusting. Okay. Um, so you need to get rid of that before you use your nib for the first time, otherwise the ink won't stick to your nib and it you'll have all sorts of problems trying to get the ink to flow. Oh, well, then thank you for the tip on that. So how do you get rid of that? Is it just you wash it or? Yeah, there's a few different ways. So I just tend, I tend to use a little bit of dish soap, tiny bit of dish soap okay. and some hot water. Um, with that, if you do it once and then the ink's still not flowing, it probably means there's still a little bit of the coating left on or you haven't got all the dish soap off properly because okay. the dish soap will, re will repel ink. So you've got to just make sure it's really squeaky clean. Yeah. So just do it a couple of times until you get the right ink flow. Okay. Um, you can peep, I mean, I've done this before, you can um, wave the edge of the nib in a flame, but I wouldn't recommend doing that because it can alter the kind of composition of the nib, I guess. I don't know how to explain yeah. it, but yeah. you don't want to be ruining your nib. Um, we talked about this before, you can stick it in a potato. I forgot to then... grab my potato. <laughs> you haven't got a potato there? I, I forgot to bring it downstairs. <laughs> Damn. So I guess it, it must be the starch that um, I thought someone scientific will tell me that's completely wrong. Okay. But it seems to get rid of the coating on that and then just give it a little rinse off. But my fail safe is just put it in some really hot water, give it a little bit of a scrub. And you'll okay. know when if the ink's flowing nicely, you'll know that the nib's ready to use. Okay. So my, yeah, so I've done mine already. Yeah, I've used this one a bit and I've washed it, so it should be all good by now. Excellent. So yeah, when you're dipping your ink, if you have one of these little one dip wonders on here, it's easier to see because you just make sure you dip just past the top of the spring. Okay. But essentially, if you don't, you just want to go about halfway up, just make sure you cover the vent hole with your ink. Okay. And then I normally just give it a little wipe off on the side just so that Nothing blobs out at the end of your nib unexpectedly. Okay. It's now, kind like, of a little bit of trial and error. 
Yeah. So, and like sometimes maybe if, if you think you might have too much on the bottom, possibly there might be a bit of a blob or. Yeah, I find when I'm teaching the most common problem is people are scared to dip enough to put enough ink on. Yeah. So they won't have enough and then nothing flows and it's really frustrating. So, so this looks like, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, probably I can looks see like there's quite a lot, but that, that'll be fine. And then the reservoir here should help um, regulate the flow nicely. Okay. Sounds good. Another good thing. So when you've done this, good thing to have is a little bit of waste paper, like a scratch sheet that you can just use to get. Can you, oh, we're still in camera. That's a good idea. Have a little burner sheet so you can go, okay, I'm ready to go. Exactly. Make sure it's not all going to blob off the end. Make sure you've got enough. So that's quite handy. So yeah, so I guess the, the first thing to, to get started with is learning your basic strokes. And this is a really nice way of warming up your hand, um, getting used to the angle that you need to hold your pen. There's about eight basic strokes that make up the lowercase letters okay. of the alphabet. So once you've learned those, it makes it really easy if you're, if you're stuck and you're on your own, just practicing on your own, you can kind of refer back to that and figure out how the rest of the letters are made. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna have a look at your setup. So you're right-handed. Yeah. So I normally have my paper um, tilted slightly to the left. Oh, so you actually, okay, you want to, oh, you tilt the other way. So rather than um, tilting your body or moving your body, yeah, you, you tilt, tilt the your paper. Right ah. handed to the left, and it means that you I was that tilting it the wrong way the whole time. You're doing it right. <laughs> I was, I was, yeah, I was tilting it right. This makes so much more sense, tilting it left. Oh, that's good. Gonna... Ready to go. <laughs> I was just going to send you in circles. <laughs> no wonder this was so hard. So the way what I do is I keep my so I keep my arms straight and my wrist straight because you want to try as much as you can to avoid bending your wrist too much. So it's not a wrist movement; it's an arm shoulder kind of movement. It's yeah, it's like full a full arm movement, ah. and then you use the small movements of your fingers to make extra adjustments and when you're flourishing, etc. But you want to okay. try and keep your whole um, arm straight so you can do these nice smooth right. movements rather than this. I got gotcha. you. So I tend to set, get my hat, get my tripod grip ready. Yep. So just holding with the three fingers, get my arm nice and straight and then move the paper so that my nib is pointing to the top right hand side. Yeah. So if you have to, if you have to have your paper at a complete 90 degree angle, that's fine. That's okay. better than twisting your body, so you've still got nice posture. Okay. Right. So, are we ready? We are. We are ready. <laughs> we're ready to roll. Okay. Let's get a little bit more ink. So, the first stroke that we're gonna learn—it's really super basic, but it's worth practicing—is just your your down stroke, which is a pressure stroke. Okay. So, all of your down strokes, you put, you apply pressure to your nib. So she. So these are pressure strokes. So as you apply pressure to the end of your nib, the two, these are called tines. The two, oh. <laughs> yeah. These are called tines. So they'll open and allow the ink to flow. So the more pressure you put on, the, the wider apart they'll open. And then the wider the stroke you'll achieve. And a little tip here to avoid. Um, pointy ends on your strokes. Oh yes. Like that. Is if you apply your nib to the paper, square it off at the kind of square the top off a little bit. Oh if you can what I'm doing. And then do your straight pause at the bottom and square the bottom off. Then you get nice uh, flat I was wondering because I would see those lines and then I'm like, yeah, mine aren't perfectly square. Because like then if you don't do that, then it tapers at the end. Exactly. And if you when you come out of your stroke, you need to remember to just be nice and slow and don't flick your pen. If okay. you do that, then you get a pointy bit at the bottom and it just looks a little bit messy. Do you want to get nice the, and slow? That's the difference with a pro and an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> it's the little things. Yeah. Okay, cool. I did not know that. So I, I normally have students practice for a couple of minutes, just doing their downstrokes, yeah. trying to get the width nice and consistent, yeah. making sure that the angle is 55 degrees. 
and um, making sure that you have nice uh, squared off tops and bottoms. Interesting. Yeah, this is and a lot more you... involved than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, another tip is just to go a lot slower than you think you need to go. So yep. calligraphy is written by its nature. It's just written really slowly. You take your time over each letter and you almost pause between and lift your pen between each letter. So it's not like cursive writing where it's a continuous flow and you can write it quite quickly. Yeah, it's meant it's meant to be very slow, so which actually makes it easier than you can concentrate exactly on what you're doing and where you're placing your next stroke. Okay. So, that, so that's the down stroke, and then this is the tricky. Most people find this tricky when they're beginning is your up stroke because you're essentially pushing the tip of a really pointed, like knife edge, I guess, yeah. into your paper, um, and it takes a really really light touch. So you, when you're doing an upstroke, so with no pressure at all, you just want your nib to glide up the page. And your aim is to get, it's called a hairline stroke as well. So your aim is for this stroke to be as fine and hairline as you can possibly get it. Mm -hmm. You wanna just kind of, these. that's why these pens are really good because they've got some weight to them. So you wanna just let the weight of the pen um, do the work and let it. Okay glide the ink upwards it's tough to get them straight it's very easy to have little teeny wiggles <laughs> yeah and I think that's completely normal especially I mean it's eight o'clock in the morning here so I haven't warmed up so even mine if you zoom in they're probably quite yeah. wobbly yeah that's the trickier one to do it's it's easier to pull it down straight than it is to push it up going straight Exactly. And you almost need to just apply less, the least pressure that you possibly can and then and then a little bit extra. So you're really can, not pressing at all on your nib. You'll know if you if you're pressing because it will catch and your ink might splatter. So it is sort of like you said, the warm up stroke similar to a singer who needs to warm up their voice. Yeah, you know, you exactly. You have to warm up your muscle memory just to know you still got everything where it should be. This is how hard. This is how I do the and, basics. Yeah. And it's, I always use the analogy because I play the piano as well. Before you get into playing any of your pieces, this is when I used to have lessons, you'd, I'd spend maybe 45 minutes doing warm up exercises just to get your fingers in the zone. It's really yeah. hard just to do it cold. And it's, I guess it's the same with this because you're, yeah, you're using the fine motor control of your fingers. I used to compete in golf, and same thing. You know, you hit some practice balls before your the tournament begins, and you hit some practice putts and chipping, and you're getting your your feel down, knowing knowing what's yeah. going on, and just yep, because you got to step up to the first tee and smash a big drive in front of a lot of people. <laughs> exactly, you don't want to mess that one up. Yeah. So then, as you get a bit more confident. If you, you were talking about the wobble, if you speed up the strokes a little bit, it helps with that. Because when you're going really slow and really okay. concentrating, we get this kind of, ah, this jitter in your fingers. So a little bit of momentum helps sometimes with the up stroke. So these, these strokes are gonna form things, uh, form your descenders and your ascend, ascenders and then okay. parts of your lower computers. So those are, those are nice to start with. And then we can start combining them. So we can do um, an overturn curve and an underturn, underturn curve okay. by combining these strokes. So it's like an N shape or a U shape basically, which are quite nice to do once you've had a little warm up on these ones. So we'll do a, um overturn curve first okay so because we're starting on an up stroke we're going up yeah. and then over like an n so you're starting with a hairline and we're going as high as our waistline and then back down again and on the down stroke you're applying some pressure and with this what you want to aim to do is keep the space um, between these two strokes here nice and yeah. parallel so oh we're just doing a small one yeah. 
Yeah, just I'm just using the um, X height here. Yeah, okay, yeah. So between the baseline and the waistline, but you can make them okay. bigger. <laughs> yeah, I'll go small. <laughs> So, I mean, this, once you start finding your own style, this doesn't have to be parallel, but it's just really good when you're practicing at the very beginning, get used to making your strokes parallel and nice and neat, just to build up that initial um, muscle memory in your hands. Mm -hmm. And then you can just go careful with it when you kind of find the sort of style that suits you. But, um. By, when I'm teaching, what I tend to tell students to do is, so you're doing your upstroke here. When you just come out of your curve at the top, just to the right, that's when you start applying the pressure. So it's maybe a couple of millimeters below your waistline. Oh, okay, below the waistline. Yes, yeah, so you come up and over, you're still doing a hairline curve and then you start to apply pressure. So it's maybe, three quarters of your downstroke is your pressure stroke. Okay. You and then it just it stops you getting a pointy top. Ah, okay. Or like a square top. It gives you it gives you that nice kind of curve shape. And then you still got to square it at the bottom like you did with the uh, with the long downstroke. Yeah, exactly. With the practice strokes we do, when we yeah. got, oh, I've just got ink on my desk. When we start joining letters, you'll be coming. So this this shape here could, for example, be an N that's leading on to an O. So yeah. when you're coming out of a letter, you obviously don't, you won't do the squaring off. I but, gotcha. Okay, you transition. Yeah. Which we can, which we'll do in a second. So that's your overturn curve. And then the next stroke is just, is the opposite. So it's your under, under turn. Okay. So starting starting with a down stroke. Before you hit the bottom, you lift the pressure and then bring it back up again. So about here-ish, you're lifting okay. up the pressure. Your curve here is, uh, is the start of your hairline stroke and then you just go back up. And again, you wanna aim for nice parallel letters. So the slower you go, the easier that is to do. Yeah, this is definitely easier than the overturn. Yeah, it definitely is. Okay. So you've got your overturn, your underturn, and then we're going to combine these to make a compound curve. So that's just, we'll do it, we'll start with the easy version, we'll start with the downstroke. So, so we're starting with a downstroke. We're coming up and then we're coming over back into a downstroke again. So you're making this little wiggly guy here. I gotcha. And this is a nice one to practice for when you start connecting letters. Because you essentially, when you're connecting letters together, you're using um, hairline strokes to connect them. Yes. So it's just a nice way to get your hand used to flowing and um, writing a bit more continuously. So again, yeah, way, you want the, here I was going to say, the here. way you're showing me, I, I definitely have to go much slower than I was before. Yeah. Especially because um, you want to keep these areas nice and parallel. So you've really got to concentrate. I see what you mean. And so the space in between them is the same too. Yeah, otherwise you end up with this kind of jazz going on. <laughs> so how are you getting on with those? It's coming along. They're quite fun. <laughs> I would have never known to have so much focus on that. It's really exhausting. <laughs> it is. It's three hours of this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, again, I would get, normally we'd spend, I don't know, maybe five or 10 minutes just doing these. Okay. And then the next stroke, 
is your ascend you've got an ascender loop and a descender loop so we'll do the ascender okay so this is going to be for things like l's and h's b's and d's <clears throat> So we're gonna use a lead-in stroke here, um, which is like a little uh, connecting stroke, I guess. Okay. It's a little hair. So what I find is the easy way, easiest way to do this is to, um, so you apply your lead-in stroke to, on your guidelines where there's like a little crossroad. Okay. Between your waistline and your slant line. Yeah. And then you can use this slant line as a guide to make sure that your um, ascender is the right angle. So you do your little lead in line, lift your pen. Yeah. And then the next stroke is kind of this shepherd's crook shape. Okay. So I get students normally to practice these two separately and then join them so that you eventually end up with that shape. Okay. And it just looks it looks a little neater than if you were to do it all in one. Yes. Like this, because then you've got no control over the size of this loop. Um, you can see here, I don't know if you can see on, on the camera, but my waistline is there, but my the cross section of my um lead-in stroke and my down stroke is slightly below it. Okay. So by separating them out, lifting your pen you can position where exactly where you want your loops and your strokes to be. Okay. It just creates a little gap in between. Yeah, and then it means if you're, so when you're um, doing a bit more of a fluid style, you can change this, the shape of your um, lead in stroke. You can make the loop of your um, a sender really big if you want and then bring it back down it just gives you a bit more control where you place everything so you're almost designing your shape okay rather than just writing a for example like the start of a letter h just had to clean my nib a bit there i think i got some paper stuck in it pushing a bit too hard <laughs> ah it's funny you should say that that's that's really good to do every every so often because you do get okay. little fibers stuck in your yeah from the paper little fibers will get stuck in the ink or the ink will start to dry and get a bit gloopy so it's really good practice just to give it a little rinse off um and then just have a little soft cloth or a tissue or something something yeah. that's not going to leave um any extra particles on your nib i guess to give it a little wipe off every so often So that's your ascender leap. And then there's the opposite, which is your dis descender leap. So this will extend from your waistline um, to the top part of your X height area, down to the bottom of your descender line. And these are nice to do because you're um, starting with a pressure stroke. So they're quite yeah. satisfying to do. So it's basically just the opposite. So we're gonna go down and then come back up with their hairline. So this would be finishing off something like a G or an H, a P, not an H, what am I about, a Y. <laughs> <laughs> and you can vary the shape of your exit stroke. So this is your exit stroke here. And this will, once you start writing words and connecting letters also, you'll want to vary the, um, exit stroke yeah, anyway yeah. just to, to make the word look balanced or you might want to add a little flourish so you might go lower you might go higher yeah so i when i come out of one of these i quite like to do a little one of those on the top Ooh. but you once you've got your word written out you can then see where to place your flourishes so that it's not overkill and so this, the word looks harmonious, but it's quite good fun. A little lasso. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get a, another page going here, running at the bottom of mine. Uh, and then uh, speaking of which, so uh, a, a lot of us fountain pen users uh, use uh, Rhodia, so we have lots of that. Can Is that something you could use with a fountain pen? 
I mean, sorry, with a uh, with a calligraphy set. Oh yeah, Rhodia pads are really great. They're bleed proof. They're really smooth, and you can get. Uh, you probably got these. There's the grid pads and the dot pads. Yeah, actually, what I'll do is I'll switch to my Rhodia because it is bigger, and um, yeah, good for practicing. I'll take the, the bigger guide sheet and I'll put it in there. And I've been using it actually quite a bit to do some practicing. So we're almost done with the basic strokes. There's one more. Okay. So the very last one is your O shape. The O this shape, okay. This is an important one. So my top tip for this is to get it, to get all of your hairline and your down strokes in the right places, you, I start just below the waistline, maybe a millimetre or two, and then you go up and back on yourself with a hairline stroke. As you come around the curve, you apply some pressure and you release it and join back up. So your join is here, whereas when you're, I guess when most people are handwriting, you're, you would join an O at the top. At the top. Yeah, so you're joining by, it. Yeah, you know, just on the right hand side. And by doing that, you don't get a pointy top on your O. And also from here, you can then go on and join to your next letter. Ah, so you don't start at the top or finish at the top. Yeah, so it just gives it a really nice shape. Um, and again here, so where you're curving over the top and at the bottom, these these are hairline parts of your stroke. Okay. And then your your pressure stroke is kind of between. It's just in the front. It's just, and it's not even the full front, it's just part of it. Yeah, exactly. If you start pressing too soon or and lift up too late, you'll end up with a square top and bottom. Okay. So you want hairline at top and bottom. Yeah. And it's an it's also a really important shape because all of your flourishes are based around ovals. So when you get onto flourishing and capitals, um, to get everything looking, you know how you see the pros on Instagram and YouTube doing it. And their flourishes always look so uniform. <laughs> they've just practiced. They've just practiced doing lots of ovals, and all of their shapes are based around ovals. So if you can get some muscle memory built up in your hand to get used to doing really lovely ovals, then it makes your flourishing much easier. So should we let people know that all the stuff you see on YouTube or Instagram or if it's TikTok? And people are pulling off this wicked calligraphy. They didn't buy a kit off Amazon for twenty dollars, and you know, two days later, they're now a calligrapher. Yeah, precisely. There's a lot of practice that's gone into that. Even I, I'm, I'm still working. I'm doing a course at the moment on flourishing, just to up my game a bit. But wow. unless you're doing it every day, kind of just for fun. Um, unless you're doing it really regularly, it's really easy to lose that muscle memory and to kind of slip back really quickly. Yeah, I bet. So, yeah, all these people you see have probably, they do it for the job or they're obsessed with it in their free time and just have a lot of time to practice. And the more you practice, you'll, if you keep your sheets from when you begin to even a month later or six months later, you'll really see the progression and things like wobble will disappear. Your shapes will become more uniform. Your spacing between letters will, you'll start to um, work out the, the right spacing and then just do it intuitively rather than having to really work at it yeah. and draw your grid lines out. Well, it's it's yeah, just the same as golf. You know, when I, when I hear you talk and the amount of hours I would spend there six days a week, from 6 a.m. till about 9 p.m., you're bound to get good and can just pull off shots and, and have muscle memory and make putts and do all these things because you've just been practicing it for so much. And so same with all those crazy strokes and they can do them probably kind of fast now too because, well, they've been doing it a ton. Yeah, precisely. And you learn which are your kind of library of strokes that you use on certain letters. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you're just doing it cold, people have a tendency to over flourish and they'll just yeah. add wiggles and curls onto everything every letter they possibly can and it just looks really messy but you kind of get to know what works um based on what other letters you've used and you have your kind of go-to strokes 
but yeah it does take time but it comes with practice I think most people if you put enough practice in can get a pretty good actually I would say I guess that's where the whole jazz versus classical comes in, right? To pull off a sweet saxophone solo, you have to know how to play the saxophone and really well and what notes work with each other and not just have some total yeah. <laughs> ear poison going on. Yeah, you got to know your chords, your time signatures. So, they, so I think we're done with all the straight. Okay. So these make up, these will make up all of your letters. So. Um, for example, you've got your O shape here. I'm going to go off the paper in a minute. An O shape here combined with your descender. It's going to make a G. Your um, overturn curves and turn into M's. So it's, it's like a lovely little reference library if you're stuck you can refer back to and kind of figure your way through um your practice if you don't have someone there helping you along the way let's see so it's just combining now those strokes to make those letters yeah they're just like the building blocks of everything's based off of the yeah exactly they're the building blocks and i would say it's probably easier to start once you've kind of mastered these and you're warmed up and you're a bit more confident, it's probably easiest to start with lowercase letters and then move on to uppercase letters. Yeah. Um, then slightly different set of strokes for uppercase, which we can do another time maybe. Um, but yeah, just getting to grips with the lowercase letters, I think, is really good. It's a really good confidence boost. If you feel like you've achieved something, you can do that and then you can tackle um, uppercase separately with a little bit of knowledge behind you. I can do the letter G now. I can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I can rule the world. <laughs> so I'll just explain. Um, so now we've now you, now you can construct letters. I'll just explain how you would connect them, which is actually simpler than you think. There's a couple of little tricks. So first of all, to get your word um, spaced nicely. Traditionally, what we would use is the width of an O to space your letters out. So this, the um, area inside your O shape here is called the counter. Okay. And if you use that as a guide, so kind of that, that amount of area there as a guide between your letters, they okay. should be nice and equally spaced. So I always have that in mind. I always have a O shape in mind when I'm writing a word to make sure that I don't have a massively fat D and then a really yeah. skinny Y, for example. So what's a good word? What I day heard, is it? Uh, Friday. I, yeah, Friday. We could do that one. Sure. Let's do, uh, and we'll do lowercase. Okay, we'll do lowercase. So I'll write it out first, Matt, and hopefully sure. I'll get my space right after I've explained that. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll watch you do it. Okay. So I've tried to use um, this width as a guide. So all these spaces here should be vaguely similar. Okay. So just as a starting point, that's a really good way to practice. And then obviously, um, you, if you lengthen the space between your letters, then it kind of makes it look more, you know, that kind of more modern, fancy style that you see. So say that again. So when you're when the space between your letters here are nice and uniform, it gives it yeah. a more traditional feel, but and it's a really yeah. good way to practice and to get everything looking balanced. 
And then once you're confident with that, you can, um, if you elongate the space between your letters, yeah, and bounce them a little bit, it looks a bit more modern and a little little bit more flowy. Okay. Um, So this isn't set in in stone. It's just a good way to, when you're starting out, to be able to space your letters so that it kind of looks nice and balanced, I guess. So you're connect, basically connecting each letter with their little hairline stroke each time. I see what you mean, how it's just all those same little strokes over and over. Yeah. And then in between each letter, you can pause or just lift your pen slightly yeah. Work out where you're going to place your next letter. So it doesn't have you don't have to commit to the word and yeah, then think, you can oh, wait. Where's go, it going? How far over should I go? And you're trying to remember that spacing so you know the target to hit. Yeah. So just I I generally lift my pen between each letter. Just okay. Really good practice. I'll adjust my camera here so we can see my fantabulous Friday. <laughs> Looking good. <laughs> Not bad yeah, that, at all. I, it's like I'm learning how to do the alphabet all over again. Like, you know, I'm teaching my daughter reading every night and we practice letters and numbers and I do this little science time with her and stuff too. Um, this, I feel like her right now. <laughs> yeah, I know, right. It's like learning another language. Yeah, it is so different. It is, yeah. There's a lot it's more very to different. it. And I think these days as well, because I don't know, well, I think people aren't really taught handwriting so often in school. So everyone has very different handwriting and that yeah. becomes the way that you hold your pen and your your go-to for how, to, how you write. So when you've got to then come back and do something that's very measured, it's, it feels a bit alien. And it is like you say, learning it all over again, learning the shapes again. So yeah, so they're the basic strokes. We've done a little bit of joining. Yeah. Um, So I normally get, I normally just, um, in the book that we have in the kit, there's the lower, the full lowercase and uppercase alphabet um, that you can place your paper over and then um, practice I just get people to spend a bit of time and this normally takes to the end of the lesson to be honest yeah oh yeah and that's just you're just learning yeah. the basic ones and then yeah so I learned this on my own but it I learned it totally how someone writes with a fountain pen would learn it not at all how, how you just showed me it so I made some progress to make some some things look fancy uh, maybe I'll show you a writing sample oh, yeah, um, let's have a look. you know but it you know, I just I was just playing around, you know, with my daughter's name and stuff like that. But how I did those strokes is so wildly different. This is me just you know messing around. Um, but how I do those is exceptionally different from how you've been showing me. I think do you know what? Have, looking at what you've done, it looks um, really nice. But I guess the difference is once you know where to apply the pressure and the shapes of yeah. things. It just makes it so much easier. So if you were to well, redo all, those, all of that, it would flow yeah. more naturally. Well, yeah, and just even like those little things, how you don't start the O at the top, you start it down a bit, and then you take the pressure off sooner. So just knowing where things are hairline and where they're not, um, taking way more time than I <laughs> it was. Yeah, those people writing way more slowly. Instagram or just, and it's so satisfying with ASMR, and boom, they're done. And so, yeah. you know, <laughs> I've been doing this That's for an hour, so now I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I find that with Instagram, everything's kind of sped up, isn't it? And you you can do everything on fast forward. And it does look really satisfying, but it yeah. doesn't well, give that, you a true yeah. representation of what they're actually doing and what it takes. Well, same with any shot. Even if someone posts a cool picture of their pen, they took several shots and the lighting to get that pen and they had to roll it and just put it, then it flipped over. Maybe they got a piece of tape and wow, look at that gorgeous pen or or anything. Like there's always effort yeah. that goes into something. 
um you know so someone pulling that off like yeah maybe it's sped up a bit or you know you just don't know the whole story that that was oh 15 years worth of experience well exactly and it's funny because i when i'm teaching i i get the people that are fine with having the patience and then people just going how do you do that so quickly and it's not like it's quickly <laughs> it's years of and i look back at my um work that even that i did for clients maybe five or six years ago and i think how was i paid to do that it looks terrible because <laughs> the just more you do it you just keep improving and keep getting better but yes yeah, some of my um earlier work i just think oh that was, was pretty shoddy <laughs> <laughs> well, and anyone would do that too. Same thing if you were an artist, you know, that's, you know, just how work evolves over time. You refine yeah. your style, you find, you know, how you like to do certain letters and then those evolve a bit and just things grow and you have a, a larger arsenal, you know, oh, I used to do W like that. Now I do it like this. And then, but you can bring those techniques back in and out and just have, you know, a plethora of strokes that you can do and you can switch your style up. Yeah, exactly. It's totally about having a library of um, styles and strokes that you yeah. kind of accumulate with. And then and you like can just watch use them. A pool player or snooker player just pull off these crazy bank shots and they jump this one. You're like, how oh, they, well, they just practice all these shots and they're just putting them together to do whatever to win the game. And sometimes they got to pull out a crazy, you know, mass A shot where they're curving the ball. That doesn't happen all the time, but if you know how to do these things, right? yeah yeah precisely actually in a similar vein so if you're you if you're doing some mad flourishing um you might write your word and then you might have to switch your paper like the complete other way around to do your to do the flourish underneath so you get all of your um pressure strokes in the right direction yeah. and then you might have to switch it like all the way around here and do the first letter of your word it's kind of and you might do it in pencil 20 times and then rub it out to get the perfect one. And then, you know, that's the one you're going to use going forward. Do you let's uh, let's um, maybe well, because we could obviously this is there's no way we can get this on one video. This is like years and years and years and years. Do you have a, a favorite letter that you that you just really love? You're like, I love my G so much. Or is there the one that you have? That, that's your favorite. Um. I'm quite liking L's at the minute. Sure. Jeez, so could you maybe do, or, or pick one that you think that maybe do like a proper basic one that someone would be following and then maybe show a difference with a modern one with some nice flourishes. Like just if you want to, you got your basic one down, you can do a, a really great textbook D or L or whatever. Now, how do you level that thing up and, and do a flourish? Well, I'm going to say, first of all, I'm not the master at flourishing. There are You're plenty. better than me. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty sure of you. amazing people that can do that. But, um, okay. So an L, so a pretty basic L. Yeah. Let's see. So, okay, here we go. So that might be a, can you see that okay? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So that's like a pretty that's a pretty nice L. I would say it would so. Look good. <laughs> it's acceptable. And <laughs> that's an acceptable L. <laughs> um, and then you can play about with um the angle of your exit straight. You can add okay. ink everywhere. You can add um some flourishes to this straight here. Okay. The way I'd normally do this actually is I'll do it in pencil and I've got like a little stick eraser. Yeah. And I'll play about with the flourishes till I get a layout that I like. So I'll do one, not sure about that, rub it out, um, try something different. So again, I'll faff about for ages until I get the one that I really like and then just practice, practice, practice that one. And then that becomes <laughs> my kind of go-to. So uh, you can, I quite like to do this where you elongate gotcha. your curve here especially okay. um if you've got a just lowercase le uh, letters to follow so yeah. you've got no descenders that are going to get in the way of this yeah. it's nice to have a big leap here and then if you leave this top bit open it gives you the opportunity once your ink's dried a little bit 
um, to go back and add some loops to it. Ah, uh, there you go, there's the fancy. Yeah, so quite often with um, ascenders, I'll keep them really simple, like on a D, for example, I'll keep it really simple, carry on writing the rest of the word, whatever I'm writing, and then you can go back and you can um, add your little flourishes to it. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah, because you could like, yeah. if there was a T in there, you could cross the T with it or something or you know, yeah, put the precisely. dot at the end of the I at the end of your your loop or something. Yeah, and if you've got, um, it's, that's especially important when you've got things like T and an H together, do you want to use the, um, a, the cross stroke of your T to become the loop of your H? Like the, if you've got like the, I would keep the H um, pretty simple. And then you can use your the cross line here of your T to turn oh, it into your that way. I gotcha. Yeah, it just kind of makes it a little bit. I am making such a mess. <laughs> Have you seen done it? It keeps everything a little bit neater. So you haven't got your ascender loop, and then you've got a line crossing through it. Yeah. And then the same thing with when you've got double letters, that can be really tricky as well. Okay. So for like a double L, for example, I would probably I'd probably play about with this in pencil to be quite honest before I committed sure. and see which which variation I like. But I would do maybe do one L here, one L a little bit shorter, and then use and then just flourish the first L, this kind of thing, rather than having them because it kind of can look a bit messy to have two. Yeah. L's together. It could entirely depends on what other letters you've got and what the balance of descenders and capitals and low, just plain lowercase letters you've got. Um, yeah, but with flourishing, I tend to kind of leave it to written the word and leave it to the end and then have a little play around. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's sort of the the style the style points are at the end. Yeah, and I would say don't worry too much about. You know, like we were talking about when you see on Instagram that someone writes in the most beautiful flourished word, yeah. they've probably worked out how it's going to look first. And then that's <laughs> the final take. You're not just as you go writing. Like, oh, like, la, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like, oh, that worked perfectly. That could have been like, <laughs> to nail that G to loop around could have been like 20 minutes until you figured it out. Oh, yeah. Easily. You practice it. And then you just, all you did was wrote the word great. And everyone's like, oh, wow, for success. Because that's what everyone always writes, right? Like just motivating words. So success, yeah. and it's just like, oh, wow, they're so perfect. But that was like hours and hours just to do that one word. And screaming at your paper and chucking it in the corner of the room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what? one thing that I always find really interesting is, say, um, the term copper plate comes from when you'd have your... Uh, illuminators or scribes they'd write out what they want to be printed on the book and then you'd get your the scribes would then um translate that onto copper plates for printing yeah okay and because because the copper's soft they would like inevitably there would be mistakes in the original writing so they could tidy up the curves make everything look perfect so when you see printed copper plate from centuries ago it looks absolutely perfect but they were able to do that before they printed the books yeah. or whatever they were printing yeah um so i think it's entirely normal that you might mess up a curve slightly so that it's not a perfect oval yeah. or you have a bit of a wobble um because they would have just been able to get rid of that and it's the same like it's basically like photoshop these days you could scan something in and neaten up a curve yeah so i think it's really important not to get too hung up on everything looking perfect and your hand yeah. being like yeah a whack on pen that can that, or an I've had pencil you know that just smooths your curves for you I can see it's that the, the modern too is like once you get it I guess with the modern configure calligraphy you don't have to be as hard on yourself you still have to know the strokes but 
if yeah. you if that descender went a little further than you thought, you can kind of recover and make it look a little cool, a little bit different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you haven't messed up the whole thing. Yeah. So it's yeah, just have I guess have fun and don't worry if it's not perfect and don't expect yeah. things to look like they do that you see on social media because inevitably that's um, a lot of work that's gone into that. For someone to write, so I have that little book and on the front it says write beautifully. For someone to be able to produce just something like that, two words, like, you know, if they started today, got a kit, um, and maybe they put in an hour a week or something like that, maybe that's all they have in their schedule, you know, let's be realistic, how long do you think it would take for someone to pull, maybe not as perfect as that, but something pretty close to that? I reckon within about six months, you six can be months. pretty good. Okay. Yeah. With kind of moderate, moderate practice, because, you know, everyone's yeah. lives are busy. Yeah. And then on the other book, you know, that's that's like a nice modern calligraphy than the other book that has the beginner's guide. Um, you can see there's a lot more flourishes. So that's just like an extra. That's a, obviously a lot more advanced to be able to pull that off. Yeah. And that's just like, again, that's kind of trial and error and working out your little library of what flourishes you do on which letters. Yeah. And again, just pra practice in that muscle memory with everyone hand is different so you might not like to do a reverse curve on those that letter but so you do it slightly different to suit your hand style too and you just your muscles or just whatever it is maybe you got you know the stiff wrist or arthritis or something you can play within those that fundamental rule set to make it also adapt to your style and ability yeah precisely that's the nice thing about um calligraphy these days is that there are less rules and so it's whatever feels comfortable and and looks nice. So I know um, quite a few calligraphers that hold their pen very differently. Mm -hmm. uh, they have beautiful writing. You think, how can you do that? The way you're holding your pen, but they just do. And that yeah. works for them. Yeah. You, I mean, it'll probably be quite hard to do copper plate holding your pen like that, but yeah. th they do some amazing flourishes. And, you know, uh, yeah, like you say, everybody's different with their style and there's no kind of set rules. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think, you know, like I said, I think we'll leave it there because we went through the basics and then how to kind of string some stuff together and then some little advanced stuff, but also to be realistic on just how much time, you know, to put something in uh, to make, you know, like just two words, right? Beautifully, like it's going to take a bit. So as long as people understand that and understand you learn the rules, you go through the process, but, you know, try to make it your own. But the big thing, like you said, just sort of have, uh, have some fun with it. Yeah, exactly. Have some fun. Yeah, don't have too high expectations of yourself. And if you can yeah. find someone that can just teach you a few little tips and tricks, it's really handy at the start. So it just saves you time. This yeah. is why your video is great. So <laughs> you've made yeah. all the mistakes and then you're hopefully all of your listeners will not make those mistakes. Yeah, this has helped me a ton. Like I thought I was I was following the book as my best I could. I'm going to I'm going to have a full review of everything coming out soon. But I thought you know, instead of just me talking about what do my engineering thing and because I'll, you know, I'll geek out on the threads and all that stuff and how it's made, and oh, yeah. it, which is interesting, but calligraphy is totally different. And um, I thought, well, let me at least try it out, see what it's like. I, I this, this is not the type of thing I normally do, but it's very enjoyable. Um, it's quite relaxing and it's you're learning something new. And it's fun. And it also improves your overall handwriting, too, because if you can do this stuff, and you have these strokes that's going to translate over just to regular cursive writing and printing and improving drastically as well yeah exactly and it's just more fun then it's more fun to write yeah it looks nice. and uh you know, like I, I mentioned to you too if you're not going to bring all this gear with you um you know i i have some vintage just flex fountain pens i got a, a pelican 140 and this omas i brought it with me and sometimes i have a different notebook and I'll just uh, practice a little bit in there. It's not going to be the same, but, you know, yeah. you can make it a little bit portable with something like that as well. Also, I know you, you guys have a, 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 a pen on your site that can take the nibs and it all fits together to make it a little bit more portable as well. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. Um, I sometimes, if I don't have a pen with me, I'll just practice cursive writing. Yeah. So it's using all the same principles, but you just don't have the thick and the thin. 
and you can do that with a fountain pen so your pelican would be perfect for that and it's really nice and light and portable isn't it yeah even um, i have a Nibbler's ahab where i got the untipped nib and because you get a thinner uh, strokes on that it's a little bit nicer to try to do this type of stuff as well you don't have to go spend 200 dollars on a vintage for getting a new well, yeah ahab. exactly 20 bucks you can you can kind of get there <laughs> exactly that's what i do with it like i'll quite often just write with my fountain pen and yeah it's just more of a joy to write when you you've got the kind of basics basics down really and your handwriting looks nicer so what's that one you got in your hand there called? Oh, so this is the Spark. So yeah. this is on us. It's the latest fountain pen that Tom's designed. This one at the minute has got a, just a regular medium nib in that I, I think it, it might be an italic. Okay. I just use for note taking. Um, yeah. But he we have a semi-flex nib, which is meant to um, emulate a calligraphy nib so that you can take it with you and you can, pra you can, you can practice calligraphy. Like yeah. you were saying, because it's straight, it can be a little bit more tricky to get the angle yeah. right, but it's great. This or any fountain pen, you know, with a flex nib is great to take, take on holiday or if you've got a long train journey or like if you've got a ferry journey over to the island, it gives yeah. you a little bit of time just to practice without getting all of your supplies out all of the time and knocking yeah. the ink over. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've even been doing it at a coffee shop my daughter does gymnastics saturday morning so my wife takes my son to soccer i take my daughter gymnastics there's a there's a starbucks across the street i hang out there for an hour sometimes i you know edit my videos for my channel i've also brought my calligraphy and, and practice it a little bit with uh just a flex fountain pen and then just even the number of people that come over start chatting with me about it because they're like oh wow how'd you get into that or that looks really nice yeah so you don't see people writing anymore do you so it's a talking point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you so, can definitely get your um, daughter, see if you can get your daughter interested. Because uh, Our daughter, Elodie, yeah. thinks it's the most amazing thing that she can write her name in calligraphy. So she, at school, she'll always do her leapy letters for her yeah. name, and she's really proud of herself. So it's nice I to get that, into uh, The custom Peppa Pig uh, holder oh, yeah. that, you guys made that thing was amazing. <laughs> she loves that pen. <laughs> she just kind of draws with it but it's just yeah. it's nice yeah. that she knows what all the tools are and she's got her own little mini one yeah and gets them to focus on something other than paw patrol or whatever for a while well yeah maybe we can get one for your daughter get her into it <laughs> so if people want to find out um more about uh you and and your your business obviously you got your website you got your instagram let's give everyone the information yeah, so the webs, everything's on the website, um, and there's a little bit of background about how we started, how Tom got into pen making, um, and that's tomsstudio.com. Okay. Um, and then we also we do have a TikTok, but nice. We <laughs> we need to keep a little bit more up to date with that one. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, Instagram is where we post all the latest products and news. Um, and just fun stuff on there yeah. and then the newsletter so we're always Tom's always designing you know having an engineer's brain that you can't switch off so he's always designing yeah. new product and if you're on the newsletter that's where you're generally the first to know about anything new um, and any discounts that we're doing any kind of special offers and things like that so it's a really good idea to be signed up to that if you're a calligrapher or you're thinking of getting into it yeah or just like like myself know nothing about it but think uh, let's try that out so yeah, yeah that was uh that was super super fun i learned a lot more and uh you know i thought i went through your stuff and i sort of kind of knew what i was doing now and uh i did not at all i was <laughs> i'm gonna have to <laughs> start over and going okay but the, all those little tips were fantastic um so well, again I appreciate you, yeah taking some time you got a crazy busy schedule and uh, so I want to thank you again for spending some time with us to teach us the, the ins and outs of getting into calligraphy. Oh, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure. It was really good fun. So thank you too. You betcha. Thanks so much.